Okay, so we left off talking a little bit about uh, the Constitutional Revolution that ended in 1909. So as a result of the, Consti uh, the Constitutional Revolution, you had these sort of attempted democratic reforms being blended with theocratic elements as well as secularist goals. And it honestly, the document that was eventually created and then finally ratified was a hot mess. So the document began to be drafted in 1906. So it's known as the, doc uh, as the Constitution of 1906, even though it didn't really come into effect until a bit later. So so the Constitution of 1906 did this. Okay, so first of all, it allowed for direct elections, particularly of representatives to a legislature. So you did have an increase of franchise. It was only targeted towards men, um, and it wasn't all men, but they did have direct elections. So, you know, that's one in the democracy column. It established the idea of separation of powers, that there would be different branches of government, executive, legislative, judicial, and that they would be able to check and balance each other. Laws would be made through an elected legislat legislative body known as the Mejlis. And, and that term is really important because Iran still has a Mejlis. Um, and as established under law, the Mejlis was quite powerful. It was able to limit the powers of the cabinet that was established under the executive branch. It had check and balance authority. It established a Bill of Rights that kind of created these notions of, um, you know, freedom of the freedom of press within parameters. Um, it essentially established the idea of like freedom of religion, but, you know, kind of weak on that issue. However, even in the same breath as establishing these sort of um, basic individual rights and freedoms, it also established that Shiism was the official faith of the, um, of the nation. So it kind of established that connection immediately. And it also created another political institution that we will be talking an awful lot about, and that is the Guardian Council of Clerics. The Guardian Council of Clerics was a group of religious authorities, um, all men, who had veto power over the laws passed by the Mejlis. Now, we will talk a lot about the modern Guardian Council, but when we talk about it, I need you to understand it is not a new creation. It's not like after 1979, people were like, what if we did this weird thing? Um, it had been established quite early on in 1906. So um, this was an idea that predated the revolution in 79. So on the left there, you can see the first elected Mejlis, the first elected legislature um, in Iran, the fellow at the center, he is the prime minister. So Iran went with a parliamentary system. There's the British influence for you. Um, they went with a parliamentary system with a prime minister. The king was still of the Qajar dynasty. Um, on the right hand side, that is the constitution of 1906. It is written in Farsi, obviously. I cannot read it now. <sighs> so the Qajar dynasty hangs on until 1925, but bad things happen to them. So as you might imagine, okay, so, you know, kind of cast your mind back here. Um, after the constitution is written in 1906, there's this big worldwide event that occurs from 1914 to 1919, um, and it's a big war. Um, and things kind of get real bad, real fast. Now, Iran, Persia isn't necessarily ground zero for any major conflict, but it does have access to oil and the British are drilling it out. So Persia does get, sweeped, uh, get swept up into um, much of the war on the side of the British. Now, in 1921, shortly after World War I, a young man by the name of Reza Pahlavi um, carried out a coup d'etat against the last leader of the Qajars. Um, he was a military officer. He was young. He was charismatic. Um, he was pretty convincing in terms of his goals. Um, and his initial goal was to overthrow the Qajars, who he saw as essentially tools of the British, um, and establish a true liberal democracy. But the British didn't want to lose the oil. Um, so he, with, he kind of, um, 
was won over by a number of British officers who offered him military support in exchange for continued oil extraction rights. So he created a centralized bureaucratic state instead of creating a more liberal democracy. Um, if you watched Persepolis, this is kind of referenced in that. He calls himself by the traditional name of Persian kings dating back to Cyrus the Great. He refers to himself as Shah in Shah um, and thus takes the title Reza Shah. Um, Shah is king. It goes after the, the personal name of the ruler um, in Persian. It does not go before. So it's not Shah Reza, it's Reza Shah, sort of like Genghis Khan. Um, and he creates um, he creates the centralized bureaucratic state. And in order to consolidate power, he wants to get rid of the authority of the Mejlis, um, much of which is loyal still to the Qajar dynasty, or um, wants to overthrow him altogether and truly establish a liberal democratic state. So, in order to consolidate power, Reza Shah ruled with a really iron fist. Um, he got rid of the Mejlis essentially. He nullified their authority, even though they continue they, they continued to technically exist, but he had true veto power over them. Now, in order to kind of pacify the population to prevent um, uh, people from re immediately rebelling against him is he pushed for full modernization of the economy. He also was a secularist. He wanted to limit the power of the Ayatollah, which he saw as sort of a threat to his own authority. And so he passed laws that uh, made it illegal for women to be veiled in public. Um, he uh, basically got rid of the land rights privileges that a lot of um, uh, madrasas and mosques held traditionally in this area. Um, men had to shave their beards. There were no religious schools uh, allowed. Um, now, and he did this very quickly. Okay. Um, he did this very, 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 very quickly. And that was a problem because any sort of major societal change um, is going to, remember, like we're talking about institutions, things that are um, important to people's daily lives, and institutions are sticky. So he tried to change these institutions very quickly. And while he did see uh, economic growth and industrialization, um, he also brought about a lot of um, anger because he changed things very quickly. Um, in 1941, there was another war on, as you might imagine, and the Iranians still had business dealings with the British through British Petroleum, through BP. Um, and during a war, oil access becomes deeply important. So the British really wanted to make sure that they held on to the oil in Iran. However, Reza Shah was a vicious anti-Semite. Um, he was very, very anti-Semitic. Um, and as a result of that, he had a lot of pro-German feelings that he made very, very clear, um, particularly with regards to genocide. And as a result of that, the British decided Reza Shah had to go. He was no longer politically useful to them. What if he sided with Hitler? If he sided with Hitler, all that Iranian oil would go to the Germans and not to the British. And so the Allies back Reza Shah's son um, instead. And basically, they kind of push, push Reza Shah out. Um, they're like, hey, how about you go retire? Hand it over to the younger kid. Um, and... Reza Shah, even though he was not particularly thrilled to do so, um, was happy enough to take a very, very, very large payout and to step aside in favor of his son. So in 1941, his son, Muhammad Reza Shah, came to power. Muhammad Reza Shah is the Shah who was in power during the 1970, prior to the 1979 revolution. He was not exactly a tolerant fellow. When he came to power, one of the first things he did was he created the Savak. The Savak is a secret police force. The secret police force was directly controlled only by the Shah and nobody else. And he used that po uh, power of the police and state violence to create a deeply authoritarian regime. Now, he created um, a lot of problems because he was um, a humanitarian, uh, like a human rights disaster. Um, political enemies were jailed, they were tortured. This was widely known by pretty much anybody in diplomatic circles. However, Iran is right across the Caspian Sea from 
after World War, like after 1922, um, right across the Caspian Sea from the USSR. And in the environment of the Cold War, um, following World War I, oh, World War I, World War II, both the British and the Americans wanted to be able to count Iran on their good side. They wanted to be able to have Iran as an ally, um, kind of as a counter to the USSR. And so the US, even knowing that uh, Mohammad Reza Shah was a disaster in terms of political rights and humanitarian abuses, um, leaned heavily on Mohammad Reza Shah and uh, made him quite an important ally. Um, there's, you can make in a lot of arguments that we were in it for the oil, although frankly, the U.S. didn't get any benefits from, from Iranian oil, really. Um, those went to BP. They went to the British. They didn't really go to the Americans. What the Americans were in Iran for was political influence and domino theory control, essentially trying to prevent Iran from falling to the U USSR. And there were active, you know, communist organizers in Iran, as you should have noted in Persepolis. Um, Marxism was very, very popular. There was a real possibility that Iran could hold elections that would be favorable towards the Communist Party. So because of Mohammad Reza Shah's incredible um, sort of um, state violence used against his populations, what you saw was the rise of an opposition force known as the National Front. Now, the National Front is a really fascinating group. Um, they were led by a politician by the by the name of Mohammad Mossadegh. Um, and Mohammad Mossadegh was a... Um, he had ties to Marxist groups, but he was broadly supported by the middle class. He was well educated. He was deeply critical of Mohammad Reza Shah's um, human rights abuses, and he emphasized Iranian nationalism. That is, the benefits of Iran should go to Iranians. They shouldn't go to the British. Um, Iran shouldn't be a tool of the U.S. and the USSR. Um, Iran should really for itself. And that resonated with the middle class. And that is going to give rise to one of the most important events prior to the 1979 um, revolution. And that is the 1953 um, MI6 and CIA attempted coup d'etat. And we will talk about that tomorrow. So this right here, that is Mohammad Reza Shah in the center of the image. Um, off to his right, our left, is his wife. And then his son is off to his right there. Um, uh, this photograph is from the late 60s or early 70s, prior, obviously, to um, the uh, prior to the revolution. And fun fact, the throne he is sitting on is known as the Peacock Throne and was stolen from the Mughal Empire in the 1700s. So I'm going to stop there for today and I hope you guys have a good day.